it is in the, may the holy names of Jesus and Mary and Joseph be blessed now and forever in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome to this magnificent solemnity today in this country of the great Thomas Moore and John Fisher, who tell us about the role of our conscience. Both grew up in England at the end of the 15th century, at a time when the Catholic faith was vibrant and a vital part of the personal and social life of the people of the country, from the king, the monarchs, the royalty, all the way down to the humblest labor, where this country was then called the Diary of Mary. But they, these two, would witness the beginning of the fall of English Catholicism as they knew it. What then sets these two men apart is the deep faith which gave them an ability to see beyond the rhetoric of the political connivances and the temptations of worldly vanities. In order to stand firm and unwavering in the face of a controversy which threatened to deprive them of their livelihoods, their freedom, and ultimately their lives. Both were then were well educated, highly intelligent, and influential men. First, Fisher, John Fisher, became the Bishop of Rochester and the Chancellor of the University of Cambridge. He was well known as a respected theologian and had a close relationship even with the royal family. When King Henry VIII sought an annulment for his marriage to Catherine of Aragon and later declared himself as the supreme head of the Church of England, Bishop Fisher, John Fisher, was the only bishop, repeat, was the only bishop in all of England who refused to comply. This is his greatness. He remained an adamant and vocal defender of the unity of the church, the primacy of the pope, and the sanctity of marriage. What about Thomas Moore? Uh, perhaps a better known figure, a husband and father, he began a career in law in the city of London and rose to the highest office of the land, which then was the Lord Chancellor of England. He was widely known as a brilliant thinker, a writer, and a speaker. A friend and trusted king, he was an advisor to King Henry VIII. But more, Thomas More found himself in a difficult position when against his advice, the king decided to alienate himself from the Catholic Church. This is what happened then. In the year 1509, the same year that he became king, Henry VIII had married Catherine of Aragon. The marriage had required a papal dispensation because Catherine was the widow of Henry's older brother, Arthur. After three stillbirths and a son who died in infancy, Catherine had given birth to a girl, the future Queen Mary. But in the late 1520s, a combination of impatience for a male heir and infatuation with Anne Boleyn, who, was, who even applied pressure to Henry to be queen and probably be through to the loss of prayer and bad advice, led Henry to voice suspicions that his marriage in to Catherine was invalid and that the Pope had given a dispensation he had no authority to give. When Clement VII refused to accede to Henry's demands for the annulment to his first marriage, the king then, what did he do? He had Thomas Cromner, the Archbishop of Canterbury, rule on the marriage instead. Then he had Parliament pass in 1533 the Act of Succession which declared his daughter Mary illegitimate in favor of the new princess Elizabeth and any future children of Henry and Anne. The following year, then Parliament passed an act of supremacy which conferred on Henry and his successors the title Supreme Head of the Church of England. Fisher, John Fisher was outspoken then in his resistance openly defending Queen Catherine, Catherine and speaking clearly 
concisely at meetings of the bishops. But Thomas More chose an alternative route. He resigned his post as chancellor and did his best to stay out of the public light. But this was not enough for the king who was determined to make him submit. As events progressed, the issue at stake finally materialized into the form of an oath by which the signatory, he who signed, would acknowledge the legitimacy of the new marriage and the rights of any children of this marriage, and also to recognize Henry as king, as head of the Church of England. A refusal to sign the oath was considered then as a treasonable offense. Both Moore and Fisher refused to sign the oath and so were arrested in the April of 15th 34 and imprisoned where in we know in the Tower of London. For more than a year they endured these harsh conditions, interrogations and entreaties from friends and family to change their mind. Thomas Moore, though had already harbored a desire for religious life in his youth to be Carthusian, so the dungeon in the tower became his Carthusian cell. They communicated secretly in writing to one another in the tower until they were discovered and the messenger threatened. Finally, they were brought to trial and found guilty of treason. Condemned to the gruesome sentence of, at that time, of treason, the normal sentence was to be hung, drawn, and quartered. Each man received a reprieve from the king, commuting this sentence to a simple, swift beheading. Bishop John Fisher went gently and humbly to his death on June the 22nd, 1535. Earlier that year, Pope Paul III, in order to help his case, had made him a cardinal. The King famously, King Henry famously declared that if the Pope sent him his hat, his cardinal's hat, there would be no head for, there would be no head to put it on. And he was true to his word. St. Thomas More followed, followed him two weeks later on July the 6th, remembered still almost 500 years later for the way he approached the execution in peace and harmony with calmness, joking even with his sense of humor with his executioners to the very point of death. He removed his beard from the chopping block reasoning that it had committed no offense, it should not be punished. Also, we know that Thomas Moore, when he was having fear in the Tower of London, he looked out at one moment and saw four Carthusians going to their death with the great joy in their heart, which gave him new strength. The important thing then to understand about St. Thomas and St. John Fisher, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is that their refusal to conform did not come from personal conviction and mere stubbornness. Rather, it came from a place of deep faith and understanding, faith and understanding, and understanding especially that the Christian church, the Catholic church, the body of Christ is one element, and that the whole body comes under the jurisdiction of the head. While the head is Jesus Christ himself, the Holy Father is the visible representative of that head on earth until Christ comes again. And no part of the church can make laws that contravene the laws of the whole church in the same way as that no individual city can make laws that are not in accord with the laws of the nation of which it is part. They were both also consistent in their understanding of the importance of conscience the Pope of all popes, conscience. While they insisted on acting according to their own consciences, even to the point of giving their lives, they did not condemn others for choosing to act differently. And Thomas More repeatedly asserted his belief that it was not his place to judge others or interfere with their consciences. So the lives and the deaths of John Fisher and Thomas More are good examples to us of the importance of having good understanding of church teaching, but also of cultivating a deep life of prayer. But it was their 
profound relationship with God, their openness to his will and his voice, which gave them the strength and the courage to act, to disregard the opinions of others, to give up their worldly positions and to die rather than risk offending the Lord. Both their intellectual and their spiritual lives combined to help them form their consciences. But it was through God's grace that they were given the courage to act. This is the story, the account we read today in the first reading, Eleazar, the ancient Jew, who refused to conform and eat the food which had been contaminated, unclean meat. He was even told to pretend to eat, but he said no, because this would be a scandal to those who saw it. Moral actions then must be aligned to the truth. Being faithful to one's conscience often goes against the majority and is therefore costly. Being faithful to one's conscience is a matter of eternal significance. Being faithful to the truth in conscience might lose us friends, but it matures our integrity and moral fiber, setting us on course for eternal and blessed union with the Lord. The marriage of Henry to Catherine was true, as, were the super, as was the supreme authority of the Pope in the church. They held to these truths both in private and public. To claim then something in, is true in private, but to work against the truth in public can only be done by violating a principle of non-contradiction, whereby something cannot be true and untrue at the same time. Like today, we see in our world when we have politicians who say privately that abortion is wrong and yet in public pass barbaric laws for the mass killing of the unborn and to add to the scandal proceed to pronounce themselves as devout Catholics and receive Holy Communion in a sacrilegious manner. How is it possible for the same individual to have two opposite intentions? What about then the relationship between the church and state? Both of these great men today were faithful citizens who loved their country and the king. Before his execution, Thomas Moore famously declared himself, we know to be the king's God's servant, but God's first. Neither man tries to, we said, impose his belief on others. And that's not why they were killed. Rather. The wicked intent of the king pursued them and gave them an ultimatum to take an oath and conform to his corruption. Their refusal led to their deaths. This unwillingness to compromise with state laws that are unjust, particularly if they are rooted in dishonesty and intrinsically evil, is one of the greatest challenges for Catholics today. Be not like then a split person with two intentions. Many were, the, many were trying to dissuade Moore and Fisher from their course of action, saying it is okay to believe one thing interiorly and do the opposite exteriorly. But both knew, like Elazio in the epistle today, who would not conform to eating this unclean meat, that this course of action was, would not only deceive a well-formed conscience, but would deceive God himself and give scandal. How many of those so-called persuaders are remembered today? Virtually none. How many remember the names of Thomas Moore and John Fisher? There are many. Thomas Moore and Fisher, whose names are written into the Book of Life. Here is the spirit of honor exemplified by John Fisher and Thomas Moore. It is a spirit of faithful and critical citizenship that we need today to be our own country's good servants, but God's first. Fisher and Moore would become like shining stars for thousands and thousands of English Catholics who prayed for the courage to face imprisonment and death rather than to betray their faith. Let us not shrink from the challenge of our day to courageously stand fast for the freedom of conscience, for the truth and moral integrity. 
so badly needed for our times. So stand firm to yourselves and your conscience. Stand firm for the truth and for the Blessed Virgin Mary. Stand firm for Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, who said in the Holy Scripture, if you acknowledge me before men, then I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. Amen. May the holy names of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph be blessed now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.